What's up, everyone, and welcome to another Star Wars news roundup. Uh, we got some Rogue Squadron news, which I'm really excited to cover. And one of those stories is from a week ago, like literally minutes after we filmed last <laughs> week's news story, they announced oh, the yeah. writer. Right. <laughs> and I was furious. Uh, but we'll talk about the, that today. I put all those negative feelings behind me. But I wanted to start with uh, a video from Associated Press. It was... Uh, Patty Jenkins in an interview was talking about all of her future projects. Uh, I don't have any direct quotes from her, but I will put a link to the video in the description. But she says she is definitely doing Rogue Squadron next. Uh, and she talked about the incredible history that's really important to honor, talking about the Michael Stackpole and Aaron Alston books and also the Rogue Squadron games. And she says, yet it must be brought into a new age because we have to tell a new story with it. And I'm just excited about all of that i mean even a little <laughs> bit just a little bit of talk about rogue squadron gets me salivating yeah it's interesting that she says it that way because that's like oh does that mean like they're pulling story ideas from those books and stories or are they just like p paying homage to them and then she says bring them into a new era so i like we've been theorizing that she's going to have this set in the sequel era. Well, yeah, people keep throwing around the new era thing, that, that phrase. Like, that's been said multiple times when talking about this movie. Without, It's very vague. Like, she could mean just a new era of storytelling, or it could mean, like, a new era of the Star Wars timeline. Personally, I, I do think it makes sense to go post The Rise of Skywalker. I'd rather them do that than recast... Wedge Antilles, because Wedge should be in this movie. Like, if you're talking about the the Michael Stackpole books and the video games, like, Wedge is central to those stories. <laughs> so I do think Wedge will be involved. And to me, it makes sense to just have Dennis Lawson today being a flight instructor slash I still would love for him to be rogue leader, get him back in an X-Wing cockpit, because we didn't get that in The Rise of Skywalker. Um he was wearing an X-Wing flight suit. <laughs> he was in he the was, Falcon. Yeah, he was in the Falcon. Put him in an X-Wing. That's where <laughs> that man belongs. So that that just makes sense to me to have him kind of pass the torch on to a new generation of pilots. But, you know, I'll that, take whatever they decide to do. That all depends on if Dennis Lawson is willing to come back. Well, see, he said that he didn't want to do a cameo in episode seven. I, I don't see him turning down a starring role or or... or very major role in this film, which I assume and hope that that will be the case. But yeah, the X-Wing books from Legends are just some of my favorite Star Wars books ever. So just to hear her say that, yeah, we're looking at all that stuff. And uh, she did say in other interviews past that, like, this is going to be a brand new story, which good. Like, I don't really want just an adaptation of those old stories. Uh, but just, yeah, that you're looking at why people connect to Rogue Squadron in the first place, and you're using that to inform what you're going to do. Great. That's enough for me. <laughs> uh, but let's go on to the writer. That was the story that dropped last week. Um, Matthew Robinson, who co-wrote and co-directed with Ricky Gervais the 2009 comedy The Invention of Lying, is penning the script to Rogue Squadron, which Jenkins is due to direct for Lucasfilm and Disney, Sources tell The Hollywood Reporter. Lucasfilm had no comment. Um, I assume if The Hollywood Reporter is talking about it, like, that's that's a reputable source. Yeah, but I there wasn't much on this writer, I, I seem to remember, like, involving Star Wars, at mm, least. No, like, not at all. Yeah. Uh, so I went back through uh, his filmography, and he's written The Invention of Lying, which I have seen and remember thinking was kind of funny. I don't remember a whole lot about it. Uh, he wrote the Dora live action movie, the Dora oh. the Explorer movie. He's writing the sequel to uh, Edge of Tomorrow, Live, Die, Repeat, and Repeat, which that movie rocks. So they're trusting him with multiple sci-fi properties here. Um, but yeah, I don't really have a reaction to this announcement just because there's not much to know about him. Uh, screenwriting is just a chaotic profession <laughs> like, even if you write an amazing script, it's no guarantee that the movie's going to be great as well. Things change constantly during filmmaking, so I'm just kind of like, 
no matter who they announced writing it, I don't know. I, I don't know how I would have reacted to it. But I also don't want to judge his filmography in the past where he hasn't written uh, much because I remember when Chernobyl came out, um, Craig Mazin wrote that. And I remember being like, I want to see more from this person. Like, they're an amazing writer. I have to watch more of their movies. And his film filmography is full of, like, Scary Movie 3, Scary Movie 4, Superhero <laughs> Movie. And I was like, whoa! <laughs> like, he got quite the glow up. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter what your past is <laughs> in screenwriting. Like I said, it's just so chaotic that, you know, if you've got the passion for it, then I have faith. I have faith in this movie still. Obviously, Same. I'm going to be very optimistic about any pilot movie. Yeah. <laughs> um, next up, we have another Acolyte story. That was our lead story last week. But Leslie Hedlund did another interview talking about how the Acolyte is very heavily influenced by the Phantom Menace. She said, I actually was very intrigued by why George Lucas had started us at that particular point. I kind of wondered, but what happened to lead up to this? Uh, that's kind of where my Star Wars fan brain went, was like, how did we get here? And why are the Jedi like this? When they're in power, why are they acting this way? So I just think for me, my brain has always buzzed around that area and wondered what's going on here or what has been going on here. And that whole thing was another great interview where she talks about playing Fallen Order and watching all of the Clone Wars. It was kind of someone following up on that question of like, you have someone in the writer's room who hadn't seen Star Wars <laughs> up until being hired. And she makes the great point that it's like, it doesn't take encyclopedic knowledge of an IP to tell a good story. Right. This this is cool news to me because I feel like if she's bringing up the fact that she's really interested in why George Lucas started where he did in episode one, I feel like she's probably going to be doing that with the Acolyte. We're going to start somewhere towards the end of the High Republic and everyone's going to be asking those questions. Why are we here? What are the Jedi up to? Uh, you know, what's going on? So I mean, yeah. she's got a lot of story to set up unless there's going to be books and, and other content leading up to this that are, that's like involving the same story. I wouldn't be surprised if there were. I mean, I'm surprised there's still no Mandalorian books. But yeah, I, it, it's it sounds like she's addressing a very High Republic question. Because I think, and it makes sense why they have been saying in the final days of the High Republic. Because that's the question the High Republic is asking. Like, what happened to the Jedi? When did they stop caring about people? And when did they start being so overly dogmatic? So that's what I think the High Republic is doing. And then, yeah, in those final days, Leslie Headland is going to pick it up and keep that train going. Uh, and I like that. But to her mention of saying that she's played Fallen Order, I'm like, hell yes. Uh, she's played Star Wars tabletop games, which is great. Like She, she seems to like really be immersing herself in these side characters and, and like side things in star wars that are like very character heavy and story heavy mm -hmm. but not really part of like the main saga which i think is a really good idea if you're gonna write a show that's not part of the main saga and in this totally different era yeah well she i think would have done these things anyway like she is just a star wars fan i don't see this as her saying this was all research for my <laughs> writing no like i think she just loves star wars and then that makes me think it's even smarter to bring on someone who is not so bogged down in the fandom. I've joked before that if I were to write a Star Wars movie, it would be terrible. Like, <laughs> I would just get way too lost in the details. And then Big Starfighter <laughs> came back from okay, the dead. Okay, well, now you're just striking gold. Like, let's write that down. Uh, somehow Big's returned. Um, yeah, I, I think that it makes sense to have someone who's on the opposite end of the spectrum to make sure you're not getting lost in the weeds and being like, does this make sense to you? Yeah. Like a newer fan. Yeah. So I, I like that approach. Uh, the next one is about Star Wars detours. Uh, someone talked with Seth Green because of, he recently made his return to Star Wars with Toto 360. And he was great in the role as usual. 
but uh, they asked him about Star Wars detours, and he had a lot to say, but I liked all of it. When he was asked if Star Wars detours would ever make its way to Disney+, Plus, he said, the most recent conversations I've had with anybody who would be in a position to say so say that it's not soon. There are 39 episodes that we finished for broadcast, but we finished them almost 10 years ago, and so there'd have to be kind of a reconfiguring of the existing stuff to make it something that Disney Plus would release as a Lucasfilm offering. And the way it's been explained to me is that there hasn't been enough interest high enough up to go through what it would take to put it out, and that there isn't an interest in releasing this content on Disney Plus from Lucasfilm. I like to think that we did the assignment well, he says, it's just whether or not the assignment jives with the current intent. I don't really have an emotional position because I got to spend four straight years making something with George Lucas, and my partner and I, and all the people that got to work on it, the artists and actors and directors and animators, we all got to make something Star Wars with the guy who created it, and so I know over those four years that he was having fun, and that's really all I care about. I got a priceless experience with one of my truest heroes, and I got to see him laugh and enjoy all of the things that he had created. And I just thought that was really nice. <laughs> that is nice. Although I wonder if the animators and, and storyboard people all feel the same way. <laughs> right. I mean, you put your heart and soul into something. You work on something for a long time, and you want it to come out. Um, I Personally, I'm on the fence about detours. Like, I'm not clamoring for it to be released. But if they put it out on Disney Plus, sure, I'd watch it. Yeah, I mean, if it's like a finished project, it might get released one day. But like he says, if it doesn't really jive with the rest of what's going on in the Star Wars universe, then we may never see it. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely like Robot Chicken Light. And that's why they were hired to do this is because George really liked the Robot Chicken specials, the three that they did. Um, but... Yeah, like the the one that leaked a couple months ago, A, I do think that was probably on purpose to see how the response was and how far it spread. I mean, I, I, I liked it. Who doesn't like hearing Weird Al in Star Wars? But <laughs> I, I wasn't like, this is the best thing and I can't wait to see the rest of it. But I just really like Seth Green's attitude that like, you know what, I'm bummed that it's not going to come out, but I got to spend four years working with George Lucas and, like, no one can take that away from me. Yeah. So. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to cover, and I put it last on purpose, is the Slave One stuff. Uh, that made such a big splash this past week. And I think it's because there was a quote about it. Because usually this stuff happens and, you know, no one talks about it. But someone happened to ask, uh, why did Lego drop the Slave One name off of this new Lego set? And the quote was that everybody is. It's probably not something which has been announced publicly, but it's just something that Disney doesn't want to use anymore. And then cue the outrage and saying that they're renaming the ship, which they're not. Like, it, it's all just this, this screams people in marketing talking about marketing and not knowing, like, <laughs> just how people were going to react. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the ship is still the slave one. It's just, I mean, with Book of Boba Fett coming out uh, and Mandalorian toys and stuff coming coming out, it makes sense to rename stuff for people to know what show it's from. Like, that's Boba Fett's ship. If you don't know anything else about Star Wars, but you watched The Mandalorian and you love, or and you're going to watch the Book of Boba Fett, uh, you're going to go looking for Boba Fett's ship. It's funny, like, this is how I know this spread around is because my parents texted me and they were like, what's going on with this ship? And so I was like explaining it to them. And the perfect way for me to illustrate it is to be like, OK, mom and dad, if I came to you and said, uh, oh, check out the slave one. And they would have been like the what? And I'd be like the Boba Fett ship, Boba Fett's ship. They'd be like, oh, him. Yeah, great. I, I got it. Like Exactly. Most people know the name Boba Fett, or more people know the name Boba Fett than know Slave One. So they put that on the cardboard box so they could sell more cardboard boxes <laughs> containing Legos. But yeah. <laughs> that's the point. They're trying to sell more toys. That's it. And it's a marketing decision. The thing I keep telling people is like, it's on the official data bank. It says Slave One. They didn't change it in the universe. But because that one quote came out and that like Disney doesn't want to use it anymore... It didn't say why. 
people are saying it's because of the term slave, which if it is, I don't care. Well, if it is and you're mad about it, why are you mad about it? Right. Like (laughs) they're not actually renaming the ship if they don't want the word slave written on a, a toy for kids. Fine. I mean, like in universe, it's like Boba Fett's not a nice guy. (laughs) <laughs> it makes sense that his ship would not have a nice name. Sure. Uh, but no, they didn't rename the Slave One. It's still on the databank on StarWars.com as the Slave One. So everybody calm down. <laughs> you keep saying that. Well, they should calm down. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it. Uh, those are all the big news stories from the past week. So uh, we'll be back next week, assuming that more news keeps on coming out. So if you haven't already, please like this video, subscribe to the channel. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitch. And consider checking out our Patreon page. As always, thanks for watching, and may the Force be with you.